After the last video, people had some questions about the Oppenheimer 70mm show. Like, how does the sound sync up? Uh, what is it played off of? Why don't I wear gloves when I'm handling the film? Uh, how does someone become a projectionist? And what's the difference between this 70mm I'm running and the IMAX 70mm that's being shown at other theaters? I think there is a little bit of confusion. Uh, when people say 70mm, I think some people think it's just IMAX everywhere, and that's not the case. What I'm running behind me is 5 per 70 millimeter film, which is usually just regular 70 millimeters. This is how it was shown uh, for a very long time, back before there was ever an IMAX theater or projector or any of that film format. And so what this does is actually the film goes in the top and it comes out the bottom, it runs in this direction. So vertical movement. Whereas with IMAX, 70 millimeter, 15 perf, that runs horizontally across the frame. So it's like if you took this projector, laid it on its side, and ran the film through it that way. But instead of it pulling five perforations of film, it's pulling 15. So you are getting a larger frame, but it's kind of very similar to what the 70 millimeters projected. This film is actually framed in a way for a 2.20 aspect ratio. And what that means is that it has like a, like bars on the top and bottom, and that's where they're kind of framing most of their shots. But with IMAX, it's like if you took that aperture plate, like that aperture that they're putting on there, and removed it. So you're seeing the entire frame of film that was uh, captured during the production of this film. And so that's kind of the difference of IMAX. And so you're not really getting an increase in resolution per se, because the resolving power of that film in that in that portion that's being shown hasn't changed between the 70 millimeter or the IMAX 70 millimeter. It's pretty much the same. You're just getting more top and bottom resolution or information area that's being shown to you in certain scenes that were shot in IMAX for Oppenheimer. That's the difference. But I'll show you kind of the uh, physical differences on the film bench. I don't agree with the whole three times the amount of resolution because the resolving power in the center of these frames is almost identical. IMAX has a slight advantage because there's a little bit more horizontal resolution, but that's about it. So the other thing that people were talking about in my last video that people were commenting on was, why don't I wear gloves when I'm threading up the projector and handling the film? Uh, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one, it's not needed uh, because the oils from my hands and stuff like that, it uh, doesn't really matter if I'm getting that on the threading leader, which is what I'm dealing with primarily. It's a part of the film that no one sees. I use it just to thread the system, and then it plays through and no one ever sees it on screen. So there's no reason for me to wear gloves or, or anything like that. I clean the projector after every show, and these tacky rollers that are meant to uh, take off uh, little particles of dirt and dust off of the print too while it runs. And so there's no reason to wear those gloves when threading up the projector. The other thing is too is that I, as the projectionist, I need to be able to feel the film. When I thread it up, I need to be able to feel it. And then when I'm checking all the gates and the rollers and all this other stuff, I need to be able to feel that film in the projector and along the, the path from the platter system and to the platter system. I need to be able to feel it and make sure it's actually sitting right in those rollers. And so if I had gloves on, I just wouldn't be able to do that. It would just be impossible. And so it's, it's an important part. That's why I don't wear gloves. There you go. There's your answer. So I know a lot of people were asking about a little bit more details about projection. Like how can they, how can they do it? How can they learn to do it? And I really don't have like a reliable resource to tell people like, hey, go here and learn it from this area. Um, but eventually, one day, uh, they're gonna have to start training people again because a lot of the people that I know that do this are retired and they don't wanna do projection anymore. So somewhere down the line, they're gonna have to start training new people how to run specialty shows like this, like the 70 millimeter. Uh, usually people that have had like, um, I mean, I've <laughs> a bunch of uh, projectionists or people that used to be projectionists uh, back when they were in high school or college or whatever, 
uh, have commented on the last video, and so it's like I feel like there are a lot of people out there that that probably could do this, like that probably be more apt to do something like this. But I think a lot of people uh, that have the capacity to kind of problem solve and um, just pay attention to the detail, because that's all it really is. It's like you just have to be repetitious in what you're doing and just pay attention to what you're doing. And then if a problem happens, uh, have a clear head and try and solve it as best you can without screwing, th screwing things up even more. <laughs> so, but this is just kind of like a more kind of detailed kind of look at like what kind of goes into running a film show. Because it seemed like a lot of people were kind of curious, had some questions like how does the sound sync up and like what things are called. And so I'm just gonna go through in this video just kind of show you what's what. So what I'm gonna do right now is actually I'm gonna check the light. And so I put white light on the screen and start this up. Motor's running. I have to like trip the fail safe right here or make it think that film's in there so it'll actually run. And then once it's up to speed, open up the hand dowser and then I got white light on the screen. So I'm gonna go out there, check it with this light meter over here and try and get around 16 foot Lamberts right in the center of the screen. Oh, that looks pretty good. 16 in the middle. So the other thing I was trying to do was uh, chase down the shutter problem. And so I had to look in the back of the projector here. So inside of there, there are a couple of fiber gears. So in case the projector gets seized up with film, it, it won't completely like destroy everything inside of there. It'll actually just strip out that fiber gear, which is a lot easier to replace than replacing the whole drive shaft uh, inside the projector. But uh, I found a screw that was backed out a little bit, and so I just uh, screwed it all the way in, and hopefully that uh, fixes my flicker problem. Some people have asked, why is the film all out in the open? Like, why does it have to go through so many twists and turns? Well, it didn't always used to be like this. There actually used to be two projectors, and you would just put a reel up on one, play it through, and then when that reel would end, you would start the next projector with the next reel and make it look seamless. So they have these little cue marks that come up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen to let you know when to start the motor and when to change over the pitcher. And so that went away because they wanted to uh, not have a projectionist up there doing changeovers just on that one screen. They wanted uh, a projectionist to run uh, many screens and so they would get rid of the extra projector and put in a platter system. Now the platter system allowed uh, projectionists to run multiple screens just by themselves. And so that's what I used to do. I used to run 12 screens by myself uh, with platter systems and yeah you can't really watch after them like you can uh, like I am doing for this Oppenheimer 70 millimeter print but that was kind of the way things went and so that's kind of a brief history of just the of why there's platter systems in booths and why it's all out in the open and not just like a direct path into the projector 
So this uh, center uh, payout control right here in the platter is commonly called the brain. And what it does is it regulates the motor speed of the platter based on how much film is being pulled out from the center. So it will adjust speed. So if the film is always pulling at a constant 24 frames a second, but the platter sometimes will vary its speed based on the weight and a bunch of other factors. But uh, usually it kind of levels out, like when it starts, it kind of is kind of finding it's like a sweet spot of like where to be constantly on and, and not really kind of putting any strain on the film. But it also depends on if the platter has been timed correctly. So that's always a big uh, thing. So I know a lot of people had questions like, uh, how does the sound sync up? Well, the sound is actually DTS, so it's six channel sound. And it's a time code that's actually on the film itself. So there is some time code running right here on the edge and it goes down into this reader. So when the film is running, that time code is getting read here and then that time code is syncing up to this player right here. This is the DTS player. And so it has the audio stored on here. We load it on, on either uh, CDs or uh, a USB stick. And that's how it works. Uh, it's just time code coming from the seven millimeter on that, just that, that edge. It's like kind of like dots and dashes, almost like Morse code, but not quite. It's just, it's just like a, a digital signal that comes in and it just tells the player what reel it's supposed to be on and where it's supposed to be in the movie. So you'll actually see like that information come up here. That's how I know that this movie is nine reels long because I can see when reel one or two or nine comes up here and I can see where in the reel it is. But I have no control over like the sync of it other than I could change my threading, like make my loop that goes right before uh, the picture a little bigger or smaller and that will kind of drift the sync just ever so slightly. But uh, yeah, that's how it works. I hope you enjoyed a little bit more of a look at the behind the scenes of what it takes to run the 70 millimeter Oppenheimer print. Uh, I really enjoy talking about it and sharing it. And it was great to see so many comments from people that used to be projectionists uh, talking about film and their experiences and when they worked at a theater in college or in high school running film or like some of these like old timers that used to work in carbon arcs and changeovers. I love hearing those stories it's like it's it's so great to hear like other people's experience running film because I do think it is kind of dying off but I do hope 
that with the success of this 70 millimeter movie, that maybe there'll be more, uh, more frequent 70 millimeter movies than there has been in the past. That'd be fantastic. So the other uh, critique that people had about my critique of the movie is that they were saying that there wasn't enough time to introduce uh, more science into the movie because it was a biopic of Robert Oppenheimer. And I don't agree with that because if it was a biopic, you would have seen him as a younger person, as a child, and his parents. There is, uh, there's only one reference to his father in there, in the movie, and uh, nothing else. And so it's actually just uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer's uh, life, as, like his academic career, and his path to uh, help develop the atomic bomb. That's what this movie is about. It's not a, a biopic of his entire life. It's more about him that uh, journey that he took to discover the, or to help discover the atomic bomb and to kind of manage all the scientists and then how he lost his security clearance. That's what the movie is about. And they could have easily uh, put more science into there, more uh, the science of radiation, of what they were dealing with. They also could have put in those criticality accidents that I talked about earlier where two scientists died on two separate occasions trying to push a plutonium core to the brink of supercriticality. Um, that would have been really cool because actually both of those scientists were there at the Trinity test. They were uh, Harry Dagelden and uh, Louis Slotin. They were both there at the Trinity test. And I think that would have been such a kind of an eerie thing to see that these people were there. And then about a, a, a year later or even less than that, they started dying because of of these criticality experiments that they were doing with plutonium cores, the demon core. And so I think that was a totally missed opportunity in this movie and I think they could have totally included it without making the movie any longer than three hours. They probably just could have edited it down and included maybe an additional one minute of footage. I, I don't know if that would have worked technically for the whole IMAX thing because that three hour limit, but it could have been something that would have been really interesting and I think very haunting for people to see, to see how these physicists were actually putting their lives in danger doing some of these experiments. Because I think a lot of people don't realize that. And I think that's such a fascinating part of uh, nuclear science and uh, quantum physics and stuff like that. And you wouldn't think that these physicists would have uh, died from these experiments that they were doing, but some of them did. And it was a very interesting part of the science that they were doing. So anyway, I hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.